Today, we're going to learn how to solve mazes using Python. Now, there's many ways you can do that, but we're going to concentrate on three algorithms, depth-first search, breadth-first search, and A star. First, we'll learn how to actually create mazes and display them on the screen. Then we'll implement each of the three algorithms. Now, all of this is covered in my book, Class Computer Science Problems in Python, in Chapter 2. But all the source code that we go through today is available for free in the repository linked to below. For our purposes today, a maze will be thought about as a two-dimensional grid. There's a start location on the grid, and there's a goal location on the grid. And there are some parts of the grid that are inaccessible that we can't traverse through that we'll call barriers. We can only move in the vertical or horizontal directions across the grid. And our goal is to get from the start location to the goal location. We'll look at multiple algorithms that allow us to traverse this maze. So we're actually going to go over quite a few different things today. First, we'll go over how to generate the mazes, and we'll also look at how to output them. And then we're going to look at our first maze-solving algorithm, Depth First Search, which is supported by the stack data structure. Then we'll see the Q data structure and Breadth First Search, which in code is quite similar to Depth First Search. And then we'll see a priority queue and a really powerful algorithm that it supports called A star. You can see here how our mazes will look when they're output to the command line. So in the top left, I have an empty maze, a maze that doesn't yet have a path going through it. The start location is represented by S, the goal location by G, and the X's are barriers, places that we can't traverse through. Eventually, we're going to try three different algorithms for solving the maze. Each one of them is here in action on the same maze. So first we see depth first search, and the path that depth first search found is shown by the asterisks. Then we see breadth first search, again the path is shown with the asterisks, and finally we see the result of A star, again with the asterisks. Let's look at how we're actually going to build the maze in code. If you're following along in the online repository, all of this code is in the maze.py file in the chapter 2 folder. Okay, you've seen imports before. We need to use a nums. We're using typing here. I use type hints throughout my code to try to make it more readable. If you haven't seen type hints before, they basically tell you a little bit about what a variable or parameter or return type is supposed to be without you having to deduce it from documentation or by reading the code. They can look a little verbose if it's your first time with them. There's a jump start for them for those of you that are reading the book in Appendix C. We're going to do some random number generation. We're going to need to use a square root function. And in a different file, we've defined depth first search, breadth first search, uh, some helper functions, A star. We'll come back to that later. First, let's look about how we're going to actually define how a maze is structured. So a maze is going to be composed of cells. And a cell is actually going to be in a num because there's only really five possibilities of what a cell can be. And it's nice to actually explicitly write those possibilities out. So we could have an empty cell. That's a cell with nothing in it. We could have a block cell, a cell that we can't traverse. We could have a start cell. That's a cell where we would start a path from. We could have a goal cell. That's a cell that we want to get to from the start. Or we could have a path cell. That's our actual route for going from the start cell to the goal cell. Another helper class is called maze location. It just represents a location in the grid, a row and a column. We could have also done this using a pair, uh, but we're doing it here using a named tuple. And a named tuple is just a tuple that has a descriptor for each of its components. So we have a row and a column. And then we get to the real meat of it, the class maze. So the constructor for a maze has a lot of default parameters. We're going to say by default that a maze is a 10 by 10 grid. We're going to say by default that approximately 20% of it is filled with blocks. That's uh, going to be done using a random number generator, so it's not going to be exact. But every time we decide, do we want to fill this spot with a block or not, we're going to look at a number and see, is it lower or higher than sparseness? We're going to usually have our start location be in 
zero, zero, so row zero, column zero. And we're gonna usually have our goal location be at location nine, nine, row nine, column nine. So when we enter a new maze, we're just gonna basically be filling in these parameters. Now, I use the convention of an underscore before a parameter name, uh, before a variable name, excuse me, if it's going to be private. So this is my own copy of rows and columns uh, that I'm setting based on the parameters, rows and columns. The rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. We use here a list comprehension to fill the initial grid completely with empty cells. And we have a helper method that's actually gonna go around through every one of the empty cells and see, do we wanna fill that in with a barrier? And that's what randomly fill does. It uses that sparseness parameter generates a random number between 0 and 1.0 and sees is it less than sparseness, so is it less than 0.2, which means approximately 20% of the time we'll fill the grid with a blocked location. We also then set the start and the goal to actually be marked on the grid. And to do that, we use the cell.startenum and the cell.goalenum option to fill in in the appropriate places in the two-dimensional list that makes up the grid. How do we actually represent a grid on the command line? Well, we print out the maze by going through every row and outputting every single value in that row as its string equivalent, joining them all together, and then just adding a new line character at the end of the row so that we go on to the next row. It's actually really compact. It's really nice here how quickly we can go from two-dimensional list to a string that actually can be outputted on the command line. What's goal test? Goal test tells us if some location actually is the place that we wanted to get to. And so we're basically just gonna look, is the location that we're looking at the goal? What's successors? Given some location in the maze, what are the other locations that we can go to? So I told you earlier that in our grid, we're only gonna be able to move horizontally and vertically. That means we can move one row down, or we can move one row up, or we can move one column to the right, or we can move one column to the left, and that's it. All that happens in successors is we try all four of these options. And the options that do not have a blocked location that have an empty location, in fact, um, in, the lo in the area that we're going to, we are gonna allow them and we add them into a list called locations that we ultimately return that contains all of the maze locations that we can get to from some maze location. So where can I go from here? What Mark does is it takes a list of maze locations and fills them in with asterisks and then replaces the starting goal again in case the asterisk overlaid the start or the goal. So this is a way of after we've actually solved the maze, filling it in with the path that we found to solve it, which is gonna just be a list of maze locations. Clear takes a path and removes a path from the maze. The reason we might wanna do this is because we might wanna use the same maze more than one time to demonstrate how different algorithms solve the same maze, as we saw at the beginning. So clear goes through the path, sets every location on the path to be an empty cell, and then if part of that path included the starting goal, we still wanna see where the starting goal are, so we put the starting goal back on the grid after we've possibly erased them. These next two methods, Euclidean distance and Manhattan distance, we'll come back to later today when we look at the A star algorithm. In maze.py, we do have a little output that you can run already to start seeing how all of this fits together. What do we do? We create a maze, we try printing it out. That's that first maze, the empty one that you saw earlier on that didn't have a path in it. Then we start trying to run depth first search, breadth first search, A star on the maze. We'll come back later and see these in action. All right, now that we've defined the maze, we're ready for our first maze solving algorithm. And our first algorithm is depth first search. Depth first search is about going as deep as you can and then turning back when you hit someplace where you can't go any deeper. 
So in the example here, we keep trying to go the same direction. We're going up, 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 up. And then we hit this barrier. And once we hit the barrier, we can't go any further, so we have to backtrack to the last location. The last location where we could go a different direction was location 4. So we come back to location 4 after we've been at location 5, and now we try going a different direction. We again, when we go the different direction, want to go up, but we can't because there's another barrier. Then we try the second place we tried last time to the right. Can't do that either. There's a barrier. So we try another location that we want to go, which is down. Now we have an option when we're here, so we can go to the right. That's our second choice always. Up was our first choice, but we had already been there before. So we continue on. Basically, the key point about depth first search is that every time we get to a point that we can't go any further, we backtrack to the last point where we could go a different direction and we continue from there. This, as you might imagine, this is not necessarily the most efficient way to solve this maze. We will see other algorithms that give us the best way to solve the maze. For our purposes, depth first search is just a way to solve the maze. To actually implement depth first search, we're going to need a data structure known as a stack. A stack is actually pretty easy to imagine as a stack of papers in terms of how it works. Imagine we're grading an exam. We're getting the papers in. The first paper that comes in is from Ricky. And then we get our next paper in from Sally. And then after Sally, we get our next paper in from Vicky. And then after Vicky, we get our final paper in from Mark. Now note that Mark actually handed his exam in last. However, Mark is actually going to get his exam graded first because he has the first paper on the top of the stack. So the last paper handed in is the first paper that actually gets graded. Well, unfortunately for Mark, that was a really bad choice. Then we're just going to keep going backwards. So we end up going from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack until we find the final paper, which was actually the first paper that was actually handed in. That's pretty amazing. So we say that a stack is last in, first out. In other words, the last paper that gets handed in is the first paper that comes out. Now that we've seen what a stack is, let's talk about how we can implement it in Python. So here we see what could be the elements in a Python list. Perhaps they're strings of single letters, and they're always being added in onto the right-hand side. You can think about the right-hand side as the end of the list. Then when we remove them, we're always removing them from the right-hand side. This is just like the stack of papers. The last item being added to the right is always the first item being pulled off from the right. So in a sense, we've just implemented a stack of papers by just always using the same side of a Python list. One final way of thinking about a stack that I'll mention is that the newest thing added is always the first thing taken off. So we're always removing the youngest, the newest items from the stack because they were the most recently added things. Here's the actual code implementation of a stack in Python. And you know, it's really easy to implement a stack in Python because you can use a list as a backing store and list has some built-in methods that make it really trivial to implement a stack. So don't get too worried by this generic T part up here that's part of the stack. What it's say, that's a type annotation. And what it's saying here is that a stack is of some type. So it's a stack of integers or it's a stack of strings. And the list is actually going to have the same type, of course, because it's the backing store. So it's a list of integers or a list of strings that's backing up the stack of integers or the stack of strings. Two key methods, and we're going to see these again in both a queue and a priority queue. Push is for adding an item onto the stack. Pop is for removing an item from the stack. 
and they make use of some methods built into lists in Python that make this really easy. Append will always add an item onto the end of a list. You can think about it again as like the right-hand side of the list from our diagram. Pop removes and returns an item from the right-hand side of a list. And so we're just calling pop on a list here to implement pop for the stack. Then we have two other pretty trivial methods. Empty just tells us, is there anything left? And we just check to see, is the list still valid? And representation, we're just gonna return the representation of the list that backs the stack. So really easy to implement a stack in Python by just using a list and a list built-in methods, being really sure that you're always adding and removing items from the same side of the list. Now that we understand stacks, we're almost ready to implement depth first search. I've implemented a graphical user interface version of our program using tkinter to illustrate depth first search and later on we'll use it again to illustrate breadth first search. And I'm gonna put a link below the video so you can check out the repository with the tkinter source code if you wanna mess around with it. The code is really similar to the code we're gonna look at a little bit later, except for that it adds all these tkinter GUI components. Before we actually run it, let me tell you a little bit about the two data structures that we're gonna to need to implement a depth first search. The first one is a stack of states. You can think about them as places that we're considering searching. And we can call that the frontier. And we're actually gonna implement it using a stack, which we just implemented in Python. And the other data structure is the set of states that we've already searched. And we're gonna call that explored. And we're gonna implement that using a Python set. As long as there are more states in the frontier, that's the places we still are thinking about searching, uh, the depth first search is gonna keep checking whether they're the goal. If a state is the goal, the depth first search will stop and it's gonna return that state. Um, if it's not the goal, what it'll do is add all the successors of that state to the frontier. And we saw earlier in the maze class how to find the successors of any given cell in the maze. We're also gonna mark every state that we visit as having been searched in the explored set. That way we're not gonna get caught in a circle going back around and again and again to states that we've already searched. So Explorer is just keeping track of, hey, we've already been there, don't need to go there again. If at some point the frontier is empty, it means there's nowhere left to search and we're done. We never found the destination if we get to the point where the frontier is empty. Okay, let's try running this. Now, what you'll see here is red is our goal, black is barriers, white are empty places we haven't been to, and green is where we start from. So I'm gonna run it now. What you're seeing in orange, that's the frontier. And you're also seeing on the right-hand side, I know the text is a little bit small, but on the right-hand side, those are items being added to the frontier. But notice as blue moves, blue is the current node that we're on we actually are removing an item from the frontier. So every time we go to a new place, we're going into the frontier, which is a stack, and we're saying, hey, uh, pop the next thing off the stack, let's go search from there. And then we continue to move. Now, what you'll notice about us moving along here is that we're not actually going in any kind of targeted way towards the goal. We're not using any information about the goal to direct ourselves. We just keep continually moving to the next place on the frontier, and that's gonna be the last place added to the stack. Remember, a stack is last in, first out. So we're continually adding new items to the end of the frontier, and then that last item added to the frontier is the next one we explored. But we're also adding a couple other items every time, right? Because everywhere we are, there's another, usually up to three items that we could be adding to the stack, but we're only looking at one of them each time. And so we're actually adding more items to the stack often than we're removing from it. And so our frontier a lot of times is growing, but every time we go to a new place, it's shrinking. Now, you'll notice we actually missed the goal here, right? Because again, there's nothing directed here about which way to go. We're just always going to the last item added onto the stack, which there's really no intelligence to. We just keep adding whatever items are next to the current node to the stack. Once we hit a dead end, we end up going back to the next item on the stack. So that's gonna be an item we saw earlier and we didn't end up actually going to right away because we went to the item that just happened to be at the end of the stack. Now we got to an item that actually got us to the goal. 
And so what gets illustrated for us in the end here in cyan, which hopefully you can see here, this is the cyan path here, is our path that we found using depth first search from the start to the goal. And how do we generate the path? Well, every item that we came to, we marked the node that we got to it from. And so then we can actually work backwards when we get to the final goal, we can look backwards, oh, we got to the goal from this node. And when we actually put this node onto the frontier, we marked, oh, we got to that node from this node. Oh, and we got to this node from this node. So then when we get to the goal, we can work backwards along the whole path. Now, look at this path. It's not very good. Why is it not very good? It's going totally out of the way to the right here into kind of uh, this useless area that is totally blocked off before coming back around and going all the way to the left to get back here to the goal. It's definitely not the shortest path to the goal. So that's something that you should know about depth first search. Depth first search does not give you necessarily the best path, as in the shortest path to the goal. Notice also that there's actually some parts of the board that we, or the maze that we never actually explored. These two white cells over here, we never actually got to them. If we hadn't found the goal, we would have eventually gotten to them. But because at some point we found the goal, we stopped the search. Okay, one more data structure, and we're gonna reuse this data structure for breadth first search and also for A star, a node. And it just represents a point in our search. So it could be the current location on the, in the maze that we're looking at right now. So what is a node? A node is gonna have some kind of state associated with it. In our case, that's gonna be the class maze location that we looked at earlier. So basically a combination of a row and column makes up the state of some node in our maze. And it also have a parent, and that's the node that got us to this node. Now, the node that got us to this node might be no node if this is the first node in the search. So for example, the starting location where we start in the maze. That's why this is an optional. An optional is an item that either has a value or does not have a value. And so we might mark it as none, the parent, if this is the first node, if this is the start node. There's two other parameters here we're not gonna use for depth first search, but because we wanna reuse the same node class for A star later on, we need. Um, cost and heuristic are two values that we will use later on for A star, but you don't need to worry about till later in the video. So all you need to know right now is that a node is composed of basically a maze location, that's its state, so some point in the maze, and some other node that got us there. So the maze location that we got to this maze location from. Less than again is implemented again for A star, and we'll come back to it later. But basically we can just sort two different nodes by seeing how much the cost plus heuristic of one is compared to the cost plus heuristic of another. And the one that has the lower combination of cost and heuristic is the node that we say comes first. And you'll see how that's useful later on in A star. Okay, we're ready to actually look at depth first search. We made it. It's a lot of buildup to get here, but here we are. Depth first search, what does it take? It takes an initial state, so that's gonna be where we're starting from. So usually the starting maze location will be that initial state. It takes a goal test function, that's uh, in Python type hints called a callable. And that goal test fun function is going to look at some nodes and tell us, oh hey, is that the actual place we wanna to get to? Is that the, the goal in the maze? And it's gonna return a Boolean, which is gonna be true or false. Successors is again a function, that's what a callable is, which is gonna tell us from this current maze location, where else can we go to? And if you remember earlier in the maze class, we implemented a successors function. And that just told us from this maze location, these are the other maze locations that we can get to. And depth for search as a whole is gonna return either the goal node, so that means we got to the goal node. And remember that the nodes know their parents, so we can recreate the path just from the goal node all the way back to the start node. Or it could return none if there was no way to find the goal node, right? It's possible that the goal is surrounded by barriers and we couldn't get to it. Or even the starting location is surrounded by barriers. Or just somewhere there's some barriers we couldn't get through 
to get to the goal. So we could be returning none. So that's why we're returning an optional here because it could be none. Okay, let's look at depth for search actual code. So we mentioned earlier the two data structures, Frontier and Explored. Frontier is where we could go explore next. We haven't explored the places on the frontier yet, but we could explore them in the future. We could kind of go to them and see what's up and see if they're the goal and see who their successors are and add their successors to the frontier. And the frontier is a stack. So the last item that we add to consider looking at is the first item we're going to actually look at next. Explored is a set. It's the places that we've been, so we're not going to go to them again. Really simple. Don't want to repeat ourselves. Don't want to go in circles. Okay. And then look how little code it is for depth for search. This is the whole actual search, and there's really not that much to it. In fact, there's probably almost as many comments here as there are lines of code. So we're going to keep searching as long as there are still places to search. So while the frontier is not empty. As long as there's still things on our stack, we're going to keep popping them off the stack and saying, hey, I want to see what's going on with you. Are you the goal? And when there still are places to look at, that's exactly what we do. We pop the next thing off the stack. That would be the last one added to it. We look at its state. So that's the maze location, basically, right? We check, is that the goal? If that's the goal, we're good. We're done. We found the end. If it's not the goal, then we want to look where can we go to from this place. That's successors. Successors is where can we go to next? If we have already explored that place, well, then uh, that's not that useful to us, right? We don't want to go in circles. So we're just going to go continue, which takes us back to the front top of the loop, and we'll look at the next child, the next thing in successors. However, um, if it's a place that we haven't been to yet, well, now we have been to it, and we've added it to explored and we've also now put it onto the end of the frontier and that means that we will now actually go to it at some future point unless we find the goal first. Now notice we're adding all the children from successors to the frontier. So each time we go to a new node, we could be adding up to three other nodes, right? We could, we're looking to the right, we're looking to the left, we're looking up, we're looking down. We came from one of those directions, so we're not adding the direction that we came from to it, but the other three locations we could be adding to the frontier. So that's why we have to go through all the children, all three of them and add them. And then just the last one that we added because it's a stack is the first one that when we get back up to the top of the wall loop, we're gonna pop off. If we went through this loop, we went through everything on the frontier, we searched through everywhere, we kept adding everything and we never found the goal because when we get to the goal, we return, right? If we went through this whole loop and we never found the goal, then we return none, meaning there was no way to get from the starting location, going to node to node, successors, successors, adding them to the frontier, and actually get to the goal. So that just means there's no solution to this maze. One helper function, really simple, is gonna help us get the path from the node. I mentioned earlier how every node keeps track of its parent. And the reason that's so important is it means once we return the goal node, or we return the node that's at the goal, we can actually go and work backwards all the way back to the start node. And that's exactly what node to path does. It just takes the goal node or the last node we want to work backwards from, and then it generates a path by looking at the node's parent and saying, hey, parent, uh, let's add you to the path, and then let's look at your parent, and then let's look at the parent of your parent, and then the parent of your parent of your parent, etc., until we get to some node that doesn't have a parent, which is presumably the start node. And then we just take that entire path and reverse it, and we have the entire path. So we can run our depth first search on a real maze. We here back in maze.py generate our maze. We print it out, and then we try finding a solution from the start goal to the end goal. How do we do that? Well, uh, we generate a solution by calling depth for search, passing it the maze's start, passing it the maze's goal test function, passing it the maze's successors function, and we see, did depth for search return a uh, actual result? If it didn't, it's gonna be none, and if it's none, that means we didn't find a way to get from the start location to the end, but if it did, 
we get that path by calling node to path on the solution, which remember the solution, it's an optional because we could have found a node or we could have found nothing if there was no path. But if there was a node, we generate a path from the node using node to path. And then we mark it in the maze. We print out the maze and then we clear that path from the maze. The reason we clear it from the maze is that then using the same maze later on, we'll mark it with breadth first search and with a star. Let's just look at that mark and clear method uh, really quick. So what does mark do? Again, mark goes through a list of locations in a path and says that each of those locations in the path should actually be marked as part of the path inside the grid. So if you remember, our enum called cell actually has a path option. And so we're saying here in the grid, hey, mark all those places that are on that path from start to goal. And then we just make sure that we set the start and the goal on top of the path because remember the path is gonna include the start and the goal. So we wanna overwrite them with the start and the goal. And in clear, we're basically just reversing this. We're going through the path and marking them all as empty instead of as path. And then we're going in again because we might have overwritten the start and the goal with empty. We wanna then make sure that start and goal actually appear. So we're putting start and goal back in. So now we can actually run, let's try it. And we did this at the beginning, right? But we can actually see a path here that was actually generated from our code. Here's when we printed out the blank maze. And then here is our actual depth first search path. And again, you see not the best path, right? Just when we looked at the, like when we looked at the graphical version, right? We're going kind of all over the place here. We go all the way to the right. Then we end up going almost all the way to the left. Then we end up coming back to the goal. Not the shortest path. So let's now transition to an algorithm that actually can give us the shortest path, breadth first search. And just as a quick preview, you can already see here in the breadth first search result that we're getting a much better path. In fact, this is the shortest path from the start to the goal. Now there might be two paths that are equi distant from start to goal. Um, so this is the most efficient path we can find, uh, but we could find maybe another equally efficient path but it doesn't mean that this is not the most efficient path, the fact that there's another one that's equally efficient, right? So anyway, breadth first search, you can see, gives us much better paths than depth first search. What I think you're gonna find amazing is just how similar the implementations are. But to get to that, the first thing we need to do is find out about queues. We've all been in queues before, in the United Kingdom, they call queues what in the United States we typically call lines. So in the US, we might say you've been in a line to go to the bathroom and you wait in line to at the store to check out or you wait in line to get your car serviced, whatever. Um, so in some other cultures, they call that a queue. And basically in a queue, the first person who gets in line is the first person who gets out of line. So we say a queue is first in, first out. Let's just model it here. So we have a monkey uh, who is selling flowers. Maybe it's the monkey flower store. And this blue cat is the first one to get in line at the monkey flower store. And following that is this white, some kind of animal, I don't know, perhaps a sheep, the white sheep gets in there before after the blue cat. And then the beige, um, Bear, I suppose, gets in there in line after the white sheep. And finally, the green cat gets at the end of the line. Now, who's been in the line the longest? Well, actually, the blue cat has been in the line the longest. The blue cat was the first one in the line. So the blue cat is actually going to be the first one to get out of the line. Therefore, first in, first out. The blue cat loves the color blue, and it gets its pick of flowers because it was first and it gets this beautiful blue flower. Then the, whatever we're calling it, a sheep or something, um, is next in line, so it gets whatever flower it wants, it gets the red flower. And as we see, actually the last item to get in was the last item to get out, which is the opposite of a stack. In a queue, we're first in, first out, so last in was actually last out. Like with 
a stack, we can use a Python list to model a queue pretty easily. And all we need to be careful about is which side we're pushing to and which side we're popping from. So as you can see in this example, we could keep pushing to the right hand side. But then when we pop, when we remove elements, we should remove them from the left hand side. That way the oldest elements are the first elements to be removed. First in, first out. The first elements to get in there are the first elements to get out of there. Does that make sense? Let's now see it in code. We're back in generic underscore search dot pi to look at the Q class. It's very similar to the stack class that we looked at earlier. It just has two changes. If you remember, our stack was backed by a Python list. Well, instead, our Q is backed by a Python deck. The difference between a list and a deck is that with a list, it's very easy for us to add and remove to the right hand side. With a deck, it's easy to add and remove from either the right hand side or the left hand side, which brings us to the other difference. Pop on the stack was using a list and calling the pop method on list, which removes from the right hand side. Deck gives us a pop left method, which removes from the left hand side, therefore allowing us to push to the right hand side, still using append, and then pop from the left hand side using pop left. This is the only difference between the queue and the stack, but it makes all the difference in terms of ordering. By changing the side that we pop from, we go from doing last in, first out, as in a stack, to first in, first out, which is what we want for a queue. The rest of this class is the same as a stack. We're back here in our graphical version. Again, you can find the source code to this in a repository linked to below. Now, I've left up the version of the depth first search solution that we looked at earlier, and you might remember this path was pretty convoluted. Look at how many items also were on the frontier that weren't yet explored when we got to the destination. Two interesting notes I want you to remember. Depth first search did not give us the best path and it always had a lot of things on the frontier that we hadn't yet gotten to. Let's now try the same maze using Breath First Search. Now, Breath First Search is going to be a lot more systematic. In a Depth First Search, we kind of just kept going whatever way we wanted to go, and when we hit a barrier or we got to a point that we couldn't go any further, we went back, we backtracked to the last point that we could where we could have gone a different direction. In Breath First Search, we're carefully going just a little bit further away, like one unit, you can think about it, further away from our start with every progressive move across the maze. So we keep looking one further away from the start, and then we look at all the locations that are just one further away from the start. Then we look at all the locations that are two further away from the start. Then we look at all the locations that are three further away from the start. Then we look at all the locations that are four further away from the start. Pay attention to the orange nodes. The orange nodes, again, are the frontier. And you can also see the frontier. <clears throat> it's a little hard to make out because the text is a little bit small on the right-hand side, but you can see the frontier growing and shrinking as we add things to it as we explore new items on the frontier and look at their successors and remove items from it as we actually go to those items on the frontier, pop them off and look at them. So our frontier is never getting that big here, uh, but we're continually going to items that are very systematically on the frontier just a little bit further away from the start. And what that means is we're gonna have looked at every node at a point where it was as we got to it from another node that got to it from another node that was as close to the start as possible. In other words, every node that we're on popping off of the frontier here and then exploring, we got to from a node that was as close to the start as possible when we first explored it in terms of who its parent was. Did I say that in a clear way? In other words, every time we're looking at another node and looking at its parent, we're always looking at the node that is just one further away from the start. What does that mean? 
Well, look at this right here, this final solution. This is a great solution. This is actually a way better solution than we found with depth first search. We didn't go all the way to the right like we did in depth first search, then come all the way back to the left, and then finally find the pathway to the goal. We found the shortest possible path to the goal this time. And that's because we did that very incremental unraveling of the frontier by continually going just a little bit further out from the start we were able to every time we hit a new node have the most efficient path from the start to that node because we so carefully unraveled one step at a time and so therefore when we finally got to the goal node we had a complete path all the way back that was as efficient as possible because it was built by continually going just a little bit further away and keeping track of how we got just a little bit further away by marking that parent. So this is a really good solution. And look also how small our frontier is. Contrast that with depth first search. We actually ended up exploring more nodes here with breadth first search than we did with depth first search. Now you might say, okay, uh, how much does that really matter? Because we still explored almost everything with depth first search. It's really going to depend on the context of the particular maze. And there might be situations actually where you get lucky with depth first search and you find the goal really, really fast. But there could also be situations where let's say the goal was over here, like quite close to the start. And with depth first search, you ended up going like all the way over here and coming back. Whereas with breadth first search, you would have found it quite quickly. So the individual maze is really going to dictate what actually gets there faster the depth first search or the breadth first search, but breadth first search will always find the most efficient path from the start to the goal, and depth first search will not necessarily find the most efficient path from the start to the goal. So if we're looking for efficient paths, we always want to use breadth first search over depth first search. But later on, we'll look at an even more efficient algorithm, so one that finds the goal as quickly as possible while still finding the most efficient path called A star. We're here looking at the code for breadth first search back in generic underscore search.py. This is probably the most important moment in our entire video. Here's why. This code is identical almost to the co code we looked earlier at for depth first search. Really, every line of this is exactly the same as the depth first search code, except for this first line. The frontier here is a queue instead of a stack. Just making that one change completely changes how the search progresses. Instead of the search going down some long path and when it gets into some dead end, backtracking to the last point it could have gone a different way, the search is going to be systematic, continually going just one node further away from the start until we find the goal and therefore finding the most efficient path just by making that one change from stack to queue. Do you believe me? Go look at it yourself. Look at generic underscore search dot pi in the repository where all the code for this video resides. Here's depth first search again. Frontiers a stack. The rest of this code is completely the same. Let's look at breadth first search again. The code is completely the same except for that the frontier is a queue. Just doing first in, first out instead of last in, first out completely changes how we pull items off of the frontier. And by completely changing the order that we pull items off of the frontier, it completely changes the order that we explore the map. And by changing the order that we explore the grid, changes the order that we will get to set each parent of each node by. And that will therefore lead us to finding the parent that's just a little bit further away from the start each time. And then when we get to the goal, um, we will end up with a chain of parents that takes us in the most efficient way possible all the way back to the start. But the key insight is all we changed is the data structure. The algorithm actually stayed the same. The algorithm's the same. It's just having a smarter data structure. Pretty amazing. So... I don't really need to go over this again because we went over all the rest of this with depth first search. Uh, there's not really anything to add. This is literally the same.
back here in maze.py and our code for testing breadth first search is also the same as our code for testing depth first search. So all we're doing is we're calling BFS here instead of DFS. You know, come to mind, we could actually have combined BFS and DFS into a single method and just had an if statement that decided if we were going to use a queue or a stack, depending on some parameter that would set whether this is a breadth first search or a depth first search. But anyway, we did them as separate methods for clarity. And you can see here that this is, again, pretty much identical code. Let's actually run it, see the results again. We looked at them earlier, but we know that this is the original map here with nothing on it. This is the grid with depth first search on it. And look, it didn't, again, not, didn't find a really great path. It's kind of zigzagging left and right, right? And here we are in breadth first search, and it found a superb path, as efficient as possible on the same exact grid, but this time without good zigzagging, just get me to the destination as efficiently as possible. And soon we will look, look at a star, which gives equally efficient paths, but does it in a more efficient way, actually finding them. And so you notice these two paths are actually different because a star and breadth first search do operate differently. However, they both find equally efficient paths. It's just that a star finds the most efficient path more efficiently. So the algorithm itself actually doing the finding uh, operates as efficiently as possible. We've looked at several different data structures and we've seen how they've enabled different algorithms. The stack enabled depth first search which was the first maze solving algorithm that we looked at. We saw it had a couple issues. Then we saw how we could easily change from a stack to a queue, and that would totally transform our search into a breadth first search, which found the most efficient path. Now we're gonna introduce another data structure, priority queue, and it's gonna enable yet another algorithm, and this will be our most powerful algorithm yet, A star. Our analogy for a stack was a stack of papers. For a queue, we thought about a line in a restaurant or a store. When I think about priority queues, I like the analogy of a letterbox. The thing that really distinguishes a stack from a queue is the order that we remove things from them in. So with a queue, we remove the first thing in first. With a stack, we remove the last thing in. That's why a stack is last in, first out, and a queue is first in, first out. Another way to think about removal could be by priority, and that's the purpose of a priority queue. Think about your mailbox, whether that be your digital mail, your inbox and your email, or the letters that you get in the physical mail. When you open them up, I bet you don't always just open them up in the exact order that you receive them. For example, if this was some letters that I received, I won't necessarily open up the spam first. Actually, it's much more likely I'd open up the thing that said urgent on it. At least that's what I do usually. And maybe after that, after I opened up Urgent, I would then open up Royalties because I like getting my money. Um, and then, you know, bills are important, so I might open that and probably I'd open up the spam last. So the order that I took things out of this data structure was based on something innate about each of the items, which was how important they were to me. So we could say that that importance is their priority. So all a priority queue is, is a data structure where we remove things based on their importance. In a priority queue, every individual item has some kind of priority, and that priority determines when we take it out. In this example, each item has a numeric priority, and we're gonna take out the items that have the highest priority first. So instead of it being the left-hand side that we remove from the right-hand side, it's just any item in there. First we removed the nine, because that was the highest priority, then the eight, because that's the second highest, then the six, because that's the third highest, we could also do this in the reverse, and we'll see that a little bit later in our real example, where we use the lowest priority item first. All right, we're back here in generic underscore search dot pi, and we're looking at the priority queue. Now, the code for priority queue, again, is very similar to our code for queue or stack. But our priority queue, while being backed by a list, is actually controlled by two functions from the heap queue module in Python. And the heap queue module allows us to use a Python list as what's called a heap. 
Now, the data structure heap is actually beyond the scope of this video. We can't just cover absolutely everything. But let me just tell you that a heap is a standard way to back a priority queue and it allows us to quickly access either the minimum or the maximum element within the list by keeping the list ordered in a very specific way that again is slightly beyond the scope of our video today. But we just make use of these heap queue methods, heap push, which makes sure the list is ordered in a specific way so the maximum or minimum item is easily available and heap pop. Um, which then removes that maximum or minimum item. So in this case, the default heap push and heap pop are actually gonna keep the minimum item easily accessible, which is what we will need for A star. Now you might wonder, how are we figuring out what's the maximum or minimum item? So we're putting items in here, and if you remember earlier, we defined the node class, and you might remember I talked a little bit earlier about why we defined the less than sign, because we're gonna need it later for A star. That's gonna allow our heap push method and heap pop method to be able to compare two different nodes to one another and figure out which is the quote unquote smaller node by combining the cost and heuristic. So we'll figure out which is the, the node we wanna go to next by looking at which is the node that's the smallest and that's gonna be the node that we get back from our priority queue when we call pop. So we're gonna end up ordering by um, which one we, sorry, I went to Q. <laughs> Let me go back down to priority queue. Which one we want next. We're gonna end up making sure that the one that has the lowest value is the one that we get out next. I'm looking back at our solution to breath first search. And one thing we like about breath first search is that it's very systematic. We kept looking just one node further away from the start till we got to the goal. And that meant that we definitely found the most efficient path to the goal. But it also meant that we searched some nodes that were really pretty unnecessary to search. We searched nodes over here in the top right. We searched nodes over here in the bottom left. What if we use some intuition about where the goal is to help us steer and direct the search? That's what A star does. A star says, why don't I use an estimate of how far a node is away from the goal to see if that's a node I actually want to explore next. So for example, when making the decision whether to explore this node versus this node up here, they both might be equidistant from the start. But if I use, let's say, an estimate of distance, we could use Euclidean distance here to see that this node is definitely closer to the goal than this node is, then I can automatically choose to go to this node and not waste my time going to this node. In many cases, almost all cases, this will actually lead us to more quickly finding the goal. So we'll still get a super efficient path, the most efficient path, just as we would with breath first search, but we're actually gonna do that quite a bit faster. And that's the really nice thing about A star is how those heuristics guide the search. Now, there's more than one heuristic that you can use, but we're gonna go over two specific ones that you can use within a maze. And before we do that, let's look at just a little bit of math that underlies how we're gonna make these decisions about which node to search next. When we consider which node to take off of the frontier in A star search, we're going to look at every node on the frontier's F of N. What F of N is, is the estimate of, which no, of what the cost of this node is, which is a combination of what the cost has been to get to that node so far, plus our heuristic cost, which is our calculation of how far approximately is this node from the goal node. We combine the cost to get to this node so far with our estimate of how far away it is from the goal node together to get the node's cost estimate, the F of N and the node with the lowest f of n is the node that we're going to explore next. So the node, in other words, that's going to help us get the lowest cost path to the goal is the node that we really want to go to next. This is, in other words, directing our search towards the goal in the most efficient way possible. So what is a heuristic? Well, a heuristic is an intuition about the way to solve a problem. In the case of maze solving, a heuristic aims to choose the best maze location to search next in the quest to get to the goal. It's an educated guess about which nodes on the frontier are closest to the goal. 
A heuristic used with A star produces an accurate relative result and is admissible. That is, it never overestimates the distance. That's key. We, we don't want to have any heuristics that overestimate the distance. Then A star will deliver the shortest path. So if we have a good heuristic, we'll get the shortest path. The heuristics that calculate lower values leading to a search through more states, whereas heuristics that are really close to the exact real distance, but don't go over it because that's inadmissible, lead to a search through fewer states. Therefore, ideal heuristics come as close to the real distance as possible without ever going over it. We're going to look at two really good heuristics. The first one here is Euclidean distance, and you're familiar with that. That's just the distance formula. You draw a line on a map, and you see how long that line is. And you can use Pythagoras' theorem to uh, figure that out. And here we see an even simpler heuristic. It's called Manhattan distance, named after Manhattan, a borough in New York City that's roads are almost completely on a grid system. Manhattan distance is just how many uh, rows up or down or columns left and right do I have to move to get to my destination. Here we see the code for our two heuristics. This is in maze.py. So let's start with Euclidean distance. Now, what it takes is the goal, which is a maze location, and what it returns is a function that, given a different maze location, tells us the distance to the goal, which is going to be a float. So this is actually a function that returns a function. Sometimes you might want to use that idiom for situations where you want to have a function that's pre-configured that you get back that can do something for you. And in this case, we want a function that's pre-configured to calculate distances to the goal. So that's actually pretty convenient. How's this inner function work? Well, given some other maze location that we want to calculate to the goal, uh, what we do is we find the difference in x's between that other maze location in the goal, the difference in y's, this is just the distance formula from grade school. Do you remember this? We multiply the difference in x's with itself. We multiply the difference in y's with itself. We add those differences together and take the square root. This is literally how you find the uh, Euclidean distance on a piece of graph paper, just as you remember it. And then we return that distance and what we get back is something that's really going to be able to guide our search by hopefully just drawing those straight lines to the goal and seeing, hey, which line is the shortest? Now, down here we have Manhattan distance, and this one's even simpler. Remember, Manhattan distance, we're not even looking at a straight line. Well, we, we're looking at a instead a set of kind of like an L shape of where we're going to go a certain amount horizontally and a certain amount vertically. And so this is really similar, the difference being that when we do the calculation, we just subtract the columns from the location that we're going from to the goal, and we subtract the rows from the location that we're going from to the goal, and then we add those differences together and return them. Really, really simple. This is actually an easier calculation. You could imagine how um, this being a simpler calculation might be a benefit if we were working in a really, really, really big maze and had to run this calculation a lot. Uh, but in general, on any modern computer, probably the difference for most mazes would be pretty negligible. All right, we made it to A star. Here we are. This is a popular algorithm. You know, this is an algorithm that's used in the real world all the time for games, for example. When you're on, in a video game and maybe you're on a map and you need to get from one part of the map to another and it automatically figures out the best route, A star used all the time, used in directions applications um, all the time really popular algorithm. Anyway, what you might notice right off the bat is that it's not that different from the depth first search and breadth first search algorithms that we've already looked at. In fact, again, we'll have a frontier and explored. I'll explain how they're slightly different than before, but um, it's really the same type of data structures. And actually, most of this code is, again, really, really similar to breadth first search and depth first search, which is pretty remarkable when you think about how different they all work. But um, First of all, we have one extra parameter up here, the heuristic function, which again is going to be a callable in our type hints, meaning that this is a calculation that given some node gives us back a float saying, hey, uh, how far is this approximately from the goal? So we might be passing in either Euclidean distance or Manhattan distance as our heuristic. 
Then let's look at our frontier. So we've gone from using a stack or a queue to using a priority queue. That's because again, we, when we have the frontier, we wanna choose the nodes that have the lowest distance to the goal uh, in total cost. That's the F, which is a combination of G, which is the cost to get up to that point where the node is right now, and H, which is the heuristic that tells us approximately how far is that node from the goal. So combining G and H together as F, we want the lowest F off of the frontier. The priority queue is gonna give us that, which is great. The first thing we put on the priority queue is a node as we have been doing in the other two algorithms, but this time, we're actually using those two other parameters. Remember much earlier on, let's go back to the code for a node. And if you remember much earlier on, we were talking about the code for a node. I said to you, hey, cost and heuristic, uh, I wanna reuse the same node class, again, for depth first search and breadth first search that we're gonna use in A star, but don't worry about them until we get to A star. Well, now we're worrying about them. So cost is G. Cost is how much did it cost to get up to this point where this node is so far. And then heuristic is our estimate of how far this node is away from the goal. So every time we create a node in our A star search, we're always gonna set cost and heuristic and we'll look at how we're gonna do those in a minute. Going back, so our explored now, you'll notice has also changed. Um, explored in the past was a set when we did depth first search and breadth first search. Here, it's actually a dictionary. And it's a dictionary that maps between um, our state and a float, which represents the cost so far. So the cost so far is actually pretty important to us uh, because we wanna be able to see what the additional cost would be to get to this node uh, with the heuristic that we combine. So we're basically like storing the F um, in this explored list because it is possible um, that will come around to it again and find a shorter way to get to it. So we need to actually keep track of what was the, the cost to get to it the way that we've gone so far. So let me just summarize that one more time. Explored is keeping track of how much it costs to get to the node that we have explored. So that if we end up finding it again, before we said, oh, we've already explored this node, let's not bother with it again. But this time we're gonna say, oh, we've already explored this node, but hey, we found a shorter route to it. So maybe we do wanna explore it again. Okay, so we've seen this before. We keep going as long as there's still things in the frontier, that's nothing new. We pop the next node off and we get its state uh, off of the frontier. That's also nothing new. It's exactly the same as in breadth first search and depth first search. The only difference here is again, that frontier is a priority queue. And so we're popping off the node with the lowest F uh, every time that we're, we're popping instead of just the node that was the last one added or the node that was the first one added like in um, our stacks and our queues. Here we're actually using some intelligence to pop off the next node and we're using that less than calculation back in um, our node class which I've gone over a couple times in this video to actually calculate which node is the node with the lowest F. So that's basically what this less than is telling us. It's telling us, does this node have a lower F than this other node? Oh, if it does, we're gonna prefer it. Our goal test is exactly the same as in depth first search and breadth first search. And so is looking at successors. We're still gonna go to each of the successors and try to add them to the frontier. Then this next line's a little bit different. How do we figure out what the cost to get here so far is for each node? Well, because our maze doesn't um, really consider like some paths more difficult than others, we, we think moving is always about the same difficulty to move from one node to another. For the purposes of our maze, we just add one. So we just say, oh, this new node that I found, this child of the last node, is just one space further away from where the last node was. And so we just add one to get that new cost. Then we check, is this a place that we've been to before? Well, uh, if it is, we might not wanna explore it unless if it's a place that we've been to before, but we've now found a lower cost to get to it. If that's the case, 
we want to say, hey, I found this new great cost. So in Explorer, I set that cost. And then we're actually going to put it back on the frontier because we do actually want to explore it. So if it's either a place we haven't explored before or it's a place that we've actually found a shorter way to get to, we want to explore it. So we put it on the frontier. Then we go back up to the top and we do it all over again. Again, this code, look at it. It's so remarkably simpler uh, than you might have expected because it's so similar to DFS and BFS, which are pretty easy to understand. The main difference here is really, again, the data structure. It's the fact that our frontier is a priority queue and that changes everything. The order that we take things off of the frontier is dictated by whether we're using a stack, a queue, or a priority queue. And that totally changes how the search progresses. Let's actually try running it and see what happens. Now, we've already done this earlier today, so we're, I'm going to go out of generic search.py, back to maze.py, and we'll actually try giving it a run. And I just want to remind you that this will find us the best path. This last one here is actually a star. Um, and Breath First Search also found us an efficient path, but A star is going to do it while searching through fewer total places. And that is great because imagine that this was not just a 10 by 10 maze. Imagine this was a 1,000 by 1,000 maze. Well, then actually searching unnecessarily through some of the nodes we didn't need to search through might be a real problem that we don't want to waste our time with. So A star is our super algorithm. It's our algorithm that both finds us the most efficient path and it also finds that path in the most efficient way. All right, there's three things I really want you to remember about what we went over today. The first is that depth first search and breadth first search are the, exactly the same except for the data structure. We just changed the stack to a queue and suddenly we went from depth first search to breadth first search with the rest of the code identical. The second, Breath for search and A star are going to give you the most efficient path from the start to the goal. That's pretty different from depth first search, which is going to just kind of take a stab in the dark at whether this is a good path. And the last thing, A star uses a heuristic to more quickly find the path to the goal, which is really useful on bigger mazes. Thanks for watching. I plan to do a lot more videos like this, so I hope you're going to subscribe and like this video. Also, I hope you'll buy my book, Class Computer Science Problems in Python. But even if you don't, don't forget that all the source code is available for free in the repository linked to below. And you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at Dave Kopec, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-C. Until next time.